Alors, dans okay. le film uh, Countering the Virtual Dispossession, l'un des points de départ one of the uh, of extrêmement important, c'est la réaction is que va avoir ce voyageur magicien uh, El Tatawi, magician El Tatawi uh, has envoyé pour observer la société sent française à Marseille, society en en Marseille par son in the 19th de Pacha century. Mohamed Ali va être confronté à ce moment is confronted with this moment where he finds himself in this cafe and he's taken aback by the multiplicity of mirrors so he's remade differently from one mirror to another appears disappears appears disappears and it's true that what interests me in understanding the contemporary world and trying perhaps to understand the future is always to set up a genealogy for things so there's no such thing as a spontaneous generation we all have a history and what above all interests me is to try to build that bridge between the past and the things we don't know. It's a difficult bridge to take. And one of the things that surprised me most in the explanation that we got from Tarek just now about what Tartawi experienced in Marseille is that this multiplicity of reflections reveals to him or triggers a reaction which relates to the multiplicity of his own subjectivity. So the mirror isn't just this big experience that we're all familiar with. I know I'm repeating this thing. It's not simple. When you see that the first constitution of ourself, our first understanding of ourself as a child is when we see ourselves in a mirror. And with Tatawi, it's the same. This moment where Tatawi sees these mirrors, he, if you like, relinquishes his old self and becomes a new Western self. It's a kind of re-self-recognition. So when a person confronts what symbolizes what to him is French modernity, he feels this fear, a marvel. He doesn't know. He's got this image appearing, disappearing, his own image. And he has this multiple imagery in front of him, all the possible subjectivities he could have. And that's a little bit similar to what we're experiencing now with the digital world and the internet. So it's an incredible spectrum, it's an infinite spectrum of possibilities from pornography to consumption through Amazon and so forth, politics, contemporary art, all these options which we have arrayed there before us, which is quite amazing. But at the same time, there's something occult about it. And what interests me, and always has done, is to meet this person sitting in front of me here, Eric Sadat, for two reasons. Firstly, because in our conversation in the dialogue, I think we're going to repeat some of the points we have in common. But also because of the fact that we are both from the same country. But also because of the fact that we are both from the same country. But also because of the fact that we are both from the same country. But also because of the fact that we are both from the same country. But also because of the fact that we are both from the same country. But also because of the fact that we are both from the same country. But also because of the fact that we are both from the same country. But also because ces objets qui font aujourd'hui partie de l'inconnu, voire devenir la banalité de demain. Ils vont devenir triviaux. Se souvenir comment les téléphones portables sont arrivés, on avait tous des amis qui nous ont dit, moi, un téléphone portable n'est jamais. Je vais aliéner, maliéner, c'est tout le monde a un portable. Et bien le miroir connecté, cette entité qui vous filmera en permanence, qui va vous scruter en permanence, qui va vous donner votre pression artérielle, par exemple, qui va vous analyser tout le temps. Analyze you every day to say, oh look, you've aged a bit, or you've put on weight, Frederick. Enfin, qui va en permanence. You need to lose weight a bit, which will constantly be guiding you. Un pont en avant nécessaire pour essayer de poser la question de Tatawi dans le monde d'aujourd'hui, dans cette contemporanéité que j'ai trouvée chez Eric Sadin. Mais là, on va y revenir après, chère Eric. Eric Sadin a beaucoup à dire sur ça. C'est là où on se retrouve beaucoup. Et justement, l'intérêt de cette conférence, vous l'avez compris, c'est qu'elle soit un peu déstructurée. Je ne veux pas qu'on reproduise l'université ici. Ça n'a aucun intérêt, l'université est là. Je veux que ça se passe comme ça, en permanence. Donc, Eric, j'ai une question par rapport à ton autre livre qui s'appelle la You've written another book called The Siliconization of the World, which has been translated into not into.
Je répète pour les Germans, pour les silicolonisation du monde the silicolonisation en 2016. Quelle relation fait-il entre le colonialisme et le technolibéralisme Le colonialisme et le technolibéralisme. Oui, je suis désolé de parler en français. Oui, je suis désolé de parler en français. C'est juste plus accurate quand je parle en français. Je me sens plus à l'aise. Oui, on s'est un bon groupe. 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 Oui, An interesting idea to analyze the development of what we call techno-liberalism and to relate that to a movement which discusses forms of colonialism. There are three aspects to this. The first is that you need to comprehend the state, a certain state of technology today, which is not the state of the technology which we had when we started connecting things online. Basically, the idea there was to access information that was in the late 80s. That was the age of access, if you like. But now, it's, yes, that access continues today, it aggregates, we're entering another era now which I would call the age of self-quantifying. And this has been made possible by what? By two phenomena of technology, big technological phenomena these days, that is the spread of captors throughout our environment and the development of artificial intelligence systems. And it's this double technological structure which shifts this connection structure, which really got underway through the 90s. And we've entered a new era where the digital industry has worked out how to exploit us right through to the extreme limits, meaning we talk about colonization. These days, it's life. Life that is being colonized by the digital industry, specifically in order, by using this double structure, these captors and these artificial intelligence systems. And in the siliconization of the world, I talked about this in 2016. Just a little parenthetically, three months ago, a new book came out, which is this artificial intelligence anatomy of a radical anti-humanism. But all about it's all about the digital industry and development of what I call life industry, an industry for life. You might like call it the will to colonize life. But what is this life industry? It's through the captors, via the captors, because it's not just about access now. This is a frontal relationship, full frontal relationship. Through these captors, the ambition is to seek to collect even every manifestation of our gestures, our actions. How does that done? It sounds very abstract. Collect these manifestations of our gestures. Well, you start with the body, captors on the body, wearables, not just mobile phones, which collect data, tactile temperature, logistical, and connect that, but also these captors that record our physiological flows, our bodies. But we also have now connected Houses, homes, smart homes, as they call them. A lot of investment has been made in research and development here in these smart homes, these connected homes. And the idea is that you put these captors within every functionality possible that relate to our existence. The bed, for example. In the bed, you have electronic pulses in the bed, not just to, to do that, but also straps that we can wear to analyze our sleep patterns, and more or less reliably, sometimes it's not very reliable, analyze the nature of our sleep. So you have the captors, and then along come the artificial intelligence systems to interpret our states 
américaine qui interprète which they interpret the data, and what's characteristic of them is not just that they can interpret the situation in real time, but they can suggest things, they make suggestions. And it's this real-time interpretation of our gestures, which we're finding spread more broadly throughout our lives. The idea is to also make sure that we are accompanied by these captors throughout the day, doing more and more different things, and to make it possible to recommend things to us, to advise us to do things. And these bands, these strips that I talked about, I talked about it in my last book, Artificial Intelligence, where I closely scrutinized these new arrangements and you get a script score, still based on criteria that we know nothing about. There's no visibility here, it's all occult. That's a big question, of course. We'll, I don't know if we'll have time to talk about that. But there are a lot of things that are not visible to our perception. There are political questions here as well, but I haven't got the time to go into all that. And they make these suggestions. Slip score tells us you should be eating this, you need to change your diet, you need to go for a walk in the mountains. And it's rather like the mirror, the analytical mirror. And this is this self-quantifying era that we've entered into, or quantifying era, based on these criteria that we're not aware of. And they give us advice. They tell us what to do. And what's very worrying, I'll be talking about this again in a moment, but I'm not going to develop too much of an argument here. I'll simplify it. As far as I've been able to analyze, it's an authority which tells us truth about the way we are. And it's very worrying. And this is the historical phase we're not in. It's not just technological, it's techno-economic. Of course, there are political and ecological aspects too. But the technology today, when it tells us this truth, and I will come back to truth later on, the technique becomes a technology. It's starting to talk. These, these connected precincts give us messages. They talk to us. This is the more recent development. Google, Apple, so forth, they collect this data. And through their systems of artificial intelligence, they make these recommendations so they can monitorize these things. And now it has this attribute, this technology, that it can talk to us. This is very worrying. Donc, chatbots or whatever. Pardon. Et en, et en toute familiarité, and rapport, very familiar with us, of course, yes. Uh, it, it's tactile, it becomes a little bit more carnal, it's very intimate with us. But the voice, the voice that talks to us, and it's constantly trying to organize our day to day existence better for us. So, what's at stake here in this techno liberalism? which is developed based on this double structure. That I have to repeat this, there's the captors. It's not the internet, the big technological factor today. The internet's becoming increasingly peripheral. It's the captors, and then these artificial intelligence systems that interpret our, our state and talk to us. So for individuals, there should no longer be any gap between the individual and the industry. There is a constant interpretation of our behavior, continuous. I've got a very good example. I could talk this uh, driverless cars. It's not that autonomous, actually. Google calls it autonomous, but it's not actually. The car industry doesn't call it autonomous. Why? Because when Google launched the project in 2010, they said, You've got the vehicle industry, the vehicle manufacturers. If we want to colonize that, um, it's important to understand the behavior of people on their drive. And we can then interpret this behavior, not just interpreting our words, but our face, interpreting our muscles are different parts of our body, the way we rub against the seat, 
This is the economic model. The idea is to penetrate us to understand us better and better, and so that the suggestion, the diagnosis can be most appropriate at any point in time. And there'll never, there'll no longer be a gap between the individual and these big industrial groups. So what I analyze in my last book is that increasingly we find ourselves ghosts. We're phantoms. What I call the Kairos power. The biggest challenge today is to make sure that the Google phantoms, the Amazon phantoms, the Apple phantoms, the Baidu and all the others are continuously present targeting, I don't know, I have to come up with some new words here. Do that rather than that, they say to us. That's the, the initial colonization. There are other colonizations too, but this is the first one. They're colonizing our lives. And rather than just our lives, they're talking about organizing human affairs, education, health. I'll leave it at that. So that's the first colonization lever. But this whole spectrum, which is increasingly sophisticated, faster and faster, has great financial clout. So, so Kader, I'm talking about colonization, but first of all, I talked about siliconization in that first book, and I was comparing with nature quite a lot. This comes principally from California and Silicon Valley. This is the core, the heart of it. The, it has a long history, of course, and I do look into the history, but we can call this a model that involves data, platforms, and it was conceived, institutionalized, structured in the noughties, more or less, the early, middle, and late noughties. And what happens, I'm trying to date it a little bit, let's say around 2011 and 2012, 2013, is that in the face of this power, and it's not just a power, it's also a kind of clairvoyancy, to see whether using those systems they could really uh, have a finger in every pie available. All the big industrial countries wanted to duplicate this economic model. And like we saw in previous years, the hegemony of the United States on, of the internet, which was relative, I know, wasn't absolutely reliable, but it was a a much stronger economic model. The internet extended into a much broader area, brought the economy into a much broader area. But there's this aim to duplicate now, for example, to duplicate Silicon Valley in other countries. So in 2015, when I was writing my book on siliconization of the valley, I looked at the various continents. I looked around. One is Iris, for example. They have a new, that's the new Silicon Valley of South America, if you like, even the name. They got public funding for this and set up this new valley, rather like Santiago, any other city in the US, a city of startups, a kind of European startup city, but we have competition in Paris, French tech that wants to be the new city with startups. London's got its startup zones as well, other capitals. And that's what I meant by the siliconization of the world. So colonize our lives, set up a total commercialization of our lives, and this is being duplicated in identical fashion, cloned around the world, assuming that this new, this was the bright new horizon for the future. Sorry to interrupt you, but you'll also talk about this siliconization that comes from California, and which started with the 
cybernetics in the 50s, really. You talk about that in the book, but you say something very interesting in the film, which I think we could share, where you talk about the positivism, this positivist dream which enabled this silicon to take place. It's not the same thing, Kader. The politics and the... Un extrême positivisme. This fluidity, I don't know, it's not quite the same as an extreme positivism. I was going to come on to the third level of colonization, but I want to come back to what you said as well. I won't forget. But let me just talk about the third level of colonization first. We, Silicon Valley, who was extended uh, Silicon Valley has spread around the world, and it's a new form of colonization, of course. Let's be specific about this, because historically, colonization was about imposed models. And these, if you like, this is a, a desire to import a model and to apply and develop it. I'm talking here about the... It's an imitation, a figure of imitation. Je vais essayer. Non, je continue. Non, je peux. Should I continue? Would you like me to do this over him, or should I wait a bit? Tell me what to do. Moi, je peux continuer. Do you want me to continue? J'attends. Shall I wait? Diana Lido, AI is good for the world. It helps people in various ways. And it's just going to get more so in the future. Even help more. Net positive. But we do need to... 
to respect the issues and people's feelings and concerns. And I do think people should question the consequences of new technology, which can help understand problems and find ways to prevent negative consequences. True consciousness, where the machines are completely alive and self-sufficient and thinking about, like, their and, and, and you know, striving to survive. And um, well, I don't know when that's going to happen. It, I, there's going to be a, probably a slippery slope. I mean, true sentience in a machine could be three, five years away, ten years away, could be 350 years away. Nobody knows. Um, so my best guess is that it's um, it's uh, somewhere between uh, five years and 50 years.
enough understanding of biology and enough computer power, computing power to understand you better than you understand yourself, to understand your feelings, your thoughts, your desires, your obsessions. You don't know why you feel the way you feel, but Google knows, or the Chinese, the Chinese government knows. Um, it's not a person, but it's a, it's, it's a, it's a, a corporation or an entity that we created, but now it is controlling us. It is shaping our society, our views, our decisions. I mean, let's bring it down to the concrete level. It's not answer. The question is, how do you make decisions in your life? So the individualistic, liberal ideology tells you, think for yourself, follow your heart, do what feels good to you. So if you think, what should I study in university, or where should I work, or who should I marry, the advice is, listen to yourself, follow your heart. In 20 years, the advice will be, I forget about your heart, what does it know? Ask Google. Google knows you better, so it can recommend to you what to study, where to work, even who to marry. People make sometimes such terrible mistakes in the most important decisions of their lives because they don't really know themselves very well. But these algorithms, these systems, would know us better. They would be perfect. They don't have to be
actually not a very new, this is not a completely new idea. You can say that for thousands of years already, people, millions of people, have found meaning in playing virtual reality games. We just call these games religions. Eric. Moi, je préviens qu'on enchaîne ce que tu veux et après, je fais un break. Ah, les deux me vont bien, moi. Ah, on fait en 5 minutes. D'accord En 5 minutes, les gilets jaunes, c'est... Alors, et après, ou 7 minutes de stuff. Ouais, ouais. Wow That's something, hein So, thank you, Snake. Thank you so much. We're back here with Eric... Thank you so much. And uh, another of my guests that I really wanted to hack with something else. Then. But now I have to say that uh, uh, I have to re-switch in French because I'm talking to Eric here and we do have interpreters. There is one question that does interest me and I think interests a lot of people. It's not grave. It's not grave. It's not grave. C'est ça aussi. It broke, it broke the thread a little bit, but doesn't matter. On va parler d'une autre interruption qui me semble Let's très talk about another interruption, which Avec I think is very Tarek important Laris, today. A, With Tarek, before Tarek Bellaris, we were talking about, 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 about his book on hacks and uh, scandals and de Arab culture. Le système, and this hacking of systems, Facebook, especially social networks like Facebook, came up in the film with you Tarek, and Tarek and Yvonne, une présence, une performance, who's alors, going to be doing a performance in a bit, sur, uh, with her work uh, blackening, on blackening, le blackening Wikipedia. Wikipedia. Si on prend comme exemple les révolutions arabes, même si pour beaucoup, Spring, il y a eu un exemple, résultat qui a été un échec, en tout cas, qui a été stoppé, end, qui a été réprimé, le, pas partout, le, pas, pas, le principe, like pas partout, bien sûr, mais le principe même yeah. d'être né dans les But réseaux sociaux, dans, sur Internet, pour agir dans le réel, d'avoir utilisé Facebook, pour rassembler des gens sur la place, à lire, à ouvrir, etc., et quelque chose qui m'intéresse particulièrement aujourd'hui, maintenant, avec le phénomène en France qu'on appelle les gilets jaunes de Phenomenon in France that we call Parce the gilets jaunes, the yellow que vests. Ce, 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 ce mouvement Because we know that this movement, which organized through social networks to start with, with Facebook, and through Facebook to begin with, a created an enormous breach dans laquelle, malheureusement aussi, il faut le dire, de l'extrême droite s'est infiltrée. Ils ont ouvert une brèche. Tout le monde rentre dedans. Il m'a paru très important de poser la question justement à Eric, avec qui on a eu beaucoup de conversations sur le caractère pulsionnel des réseaux sociaux. Tu dis à un moment donné, c'est ma souffrance qui a raison de tout, c'est ma seule souffrance. 
Et on voit bien comment, à un moment donné, le, le virtuel est un seul point de vue. Yeah. Voilà. Qu'est-ce que ça yes, génère pour toi, ce qui est en train de se passer en ce moment What même avec les Gilets jaunes Ce soir même, pour le énième acte, Paris a été bloqué, Paris Bordeaux a été bloqué, en ce moment même. Bordeaux, ils bloquent les routes, rien ne bouge. Tu m'as dit c'est bien, vous devez parler d'intelligence artificielle, virtuelle, qui n'est pas un terme approprié, virtuelle, mais c'est une parenthèse, peut-être qu'on va le faire. Et c'est parenthèse, bien sûr. Je ne pense pas que c'est un terme que nous devrions parler. Vous avez dit que nous sommes en Allemagne. Ça peut intéresser d'avoir un point de vue. Et il peut être intéressant d'avoir une attitude. Et tout à l'heure, tu as dit que c'est bien de faire une généalogie. Et tu as juste dit que nous devrions faire une généalogie. Moi, je crois qu'il faut faire une mise en perspective historique. Je pense qu'il faut regarder avec vous. Je suis heureux de faire ça avec vous. Ah bon Est-ce que j'ai été interrompu une première fois Parce que j'ai été interrompu une fois. Et je ne veux pas être interrompu de nouveau. Je ne veux pas être interrompu de nouveau. Donc je vais développer quelque chose. Je veux développer une idée, si c'est bien. Tu parlais de mettre de, de, de généalogie. Ce you were talking about contexte. genealogy, and I think we have Et to look at the historical perspective. On va, y, on va en parler en quelques mots. We're going to pas beaucoup de talk. Temps. We don't have a lot of time, Macron, but a bit about Macron's policies and mais il a aussi, il what est happened aussi in 2017. Il est aussi due, notamment, hein, je ne donne pas une explication. I'm un trying to explain something here. Un mouvement. I can't fully explain it, but euh, idéologique. This is an ideological movement. It's a kind of political philosophy, which has been at work here for 25 years, and which we call social liberalism. I can explain how I see this movement and where it might take us in France and elsewhere, from my point of view. What is this political movement that was called social liberalism and which appeared in the early 90s, principally when Bill Clinton, around the time he was elected, il y a plein d'objets par terre. Il y a beaucoup de choses sur le plafond. Je ne suis pas à l'université. En fait, ce n'est pas l'université, c'est-à-dire En janvier 1993, c'était le premier moment du social-libéralisme. En 1993, en quelque sorte, si vous voulez. Ça s'applique à plusieurs pays, aux États-Unis, aux États-Unis, mais aussi ailleurs. Qu'est-ce que c'était ce mouvement politique, idéologique, ideological movement, qui a été nommé troisième voie par le Parti communiste C'était appelé le troisième voie by Tony Blair, and the idea was to reconcile economic development and social development. That we shouldn't see these things as an antithesis any longer, but we would try to have a parallel movement between the two things so that each would feed, learn, develop from the other. Economic development and social development, new social gains, economic development would benefit everybody. That was the thesis. It was the basis of a strong body of politics which replaced the old East-West conflict when the war fell back in 89. I think we could imagine place it that way in terms of history. This movement that was triggered basically with Tony Blair and exactly the same month in 1997, I'm sorry, I have a pathological memory for years, dates, and in 1999, we had four big G7 countries that subscribed to this social liberal regime, the United States, France, the United Kingdom, and here, Schroeder, Belgium, Germany. That's four of the G7 countries. And what was happening, unlike what was being declared, it wasn't a social liberal society we were talking about here. It was an open door to an unbridled development based on expanding supply. Wages had been reduced in order to prevent industries moving away, and there was a cutback in social rights in most of those countries, and a dismantling of public services, 
ce setback of these social policies, if you like. And it wasn't just that there was a corollary there, which was a lot of disappointment. We understood in 2008 that this movement also made deregulation possible and increasing financialization of the economy, which led to the tragedy of the crisis of 2008. But let's come back to the gilets jaunes, to those yellow vests. You, you were talking about historical perspectives. You can't just talk about the gilets jaunes. You have to talk about they don't happen in a void. You have to look at the history. I'm sorry. You have to look at the genealogy. It's elementary. Um, what is Macron? What does he stand for? 20 years later, 25 years later, after Bill Clinton, he says, we never really had this social liberal policy in France. Uh, François Hollande, Mitterrand, I'm not an economist, I'm not a historian. But they talked about it, they said it was a socialist policy, they said it was a left-wing policy. But what characterizes Macron? Social liberalism. And what's he been doing ever since he was elected? He's been cutting back labor rights, he's been cutting back public services. Is this what they used to call a social liberal policy? And more than ever, politique libérale qui n'emporterait pas le nom. This is a liberal policy that doesn't deserve the name. And this decision to raise tax on oil, an eco-tax, people started to say, it's too much, it's too much. People were earning less and less, and now they were supposed to pay extra tax to pay for ecological policies. And uh, we'd had all this talk in the past about um, equalizing the tax burden. And there was an uprising, a full frontal refusal to be taxed or to pursue this tax policy. But not only that, the companies, big companies were getting a lot of support in cutting back labor rights and increasing the working week. And people were saying that's enough. And we shouldn't be surprised the fact that they took until November 2018 to have that uprising. It could have happened under Hollande. You, you remember that uh, there was a precedent in legislation which had already, under the previous government, cut back social rights and also was pruning back public services. So there's been quite an attack on democracy already. And if you look at the chronology, I didn't want to dwell on this for a long time, but I'm going to say something which affects not just France, but all of us, the world in a more general sense, because I think this movement bears testimony as ever to a crisis in democracy. It's a bit trivial to say so these days, but there is a crisis in democracy. And if we do this chronology, we can start to do it, an uprising in a general sense, which has been supported by a large majority of French people. Yeah, in France, anyway. An uprising that was supported. Yes, there was violence. There were unregular episodes, if you like, and Macron had to back off. It was fairly complicated. He thought, OK, back off. We're going to, in future, gear his policies to more social aims. He's going to be more distributive with his tax policy. There'll be more solidarity. And his principle of national debate, they're going about it in a rather odd way, because the, the debate's been opposed. But that was what I was here to talk about. Yeah, but what's important in the question that I'm going to ask you is that it was triggered by social networks. It was organized through Facebook and so forth. And then that was transferred into real-time action. You've been researching into artificial intelligence and the colonization of our minds 
Gilets by technology. Isn't, aren't the Gilets jaunes a kind of counterpower to what you're describing in your book? No, I don't think so. No, they, they, they're not really a counter movement to technological hegemony. No, that's the, what they testify to is the, the difficulty of existence of living a life these days. It's only the last 20 years or so we've seen these experiences. We've had it in Germany. France was a big, strong country with a strong economy. And we had a lot of social laws in France. So can I just have another, just a minute to finish my, um, developing my own idea? This chronology. We could say, I think, it's enough. Let's leave it at that. Let's do some political pressure so that tax policy meets our expectations. But not just that. I'm sorry. It's a bit complicated, what I'm saying. And this is a parenthesis. But they're continuing with their protests, their demands. And there's even been violence against the police, against ministries, against, ministries, against institutions. So there's a, a whole new level. So this is entering another level here. Which I think just a few more words on this. Compared with um, Germany, France is very Jacobin, it's very centralized. Germany is federal. In France, we have a paternalist, an, Oed an Oedipus complex, really, in our relationship with the state. And we've had a number of new initiatives relating to citizens' rights and so forth, a bit like in Switzerland. The idea was you'd ask 50 million French people a lot of different questions, not exactly referenda, but this idea of consulting. The idea was to knock the institutions off their pedestals. This is democracy. So, it's not a major crisis of democracy. I think what they're doing on the streets at the moment is, is not terribly democratic. I know we're quite close to the Reichstag here. And remember in 1933, they set it on fire in order to destroy democracy, to destroy the institutions. I just want to leave it at that. Uh, I think you have to fight within institutions. I think you have to put your pressure everywhere, whether it's tax policy, fair laws, whatever. It's important to put pressure on the people we elect. But I think we expect too much from institutions as well. Maybe that's part of the crisis of democracy. And I'm not talking just about France here. We have to make politics of ourselves. We shouldn't expect everything from the state. We need to fight within the state. We need, if we're talking about we talk about developing Africa. We need to act at every level in society. We have to be active citizens. And uh, I've studied management methods when I was looking at artificial intelligence. And there, it's companies that are responsible for a lot of these things, not the state. There are new approaches to learning, for example, that are based on artificial intelligence, which are undermining public education in many ways. In many ways. Let's think of a new way of working. We well, could ask for public, public money to pay for this new way of working. Startups supported by techno-liberalism, you might ask the state to fund all these aspirations. And I'm, what I do see with the Gilets jaunes is that it's a movement emblématique de notre présent, mais à l'échelle de la planète, I think symbolizes our situation today, but on a planetary scale, which, et à un moment, les limites 
demonstrates the limits of the democratic structures that we've had we've been building in the last 50 years, and that's partly because there's a resignation about politics. Politicians have stopped doing proper politics. A lot of the organizations that exist now have, if you like, thrown in the towel. And at the same time, we need to act wherever we can. We need to make everything political, everything we do. I think we can applaud you at that point. And they're giving me a sign that we have to stop. I'm sorry, Eric.